Well, I love Psalm 15. And um, I'm kind of on the way in here today. I was thinking along these lines. I'm really glad that we have not like gone in a certain order or actually not done the Psalms like that everybody loves first. Because what, you know, because like, there's Psalms that everybody loves, you know, Psalm 23. And we, we've done Psalm 23. There's some Psalms that just stand out when you think of the Psalms. And there's other Psalms that maybe they, they're not in that category. And then we've studied and we went, wow, that's really cool. But this is one of those Psalms that really is one of those wow Psalms. And so we still have a lot of wow Psalms left you know, as it were, the Psalms you know that you already love. And I think you'll be reminded of the fact that this is one of them tonight. Psalm 15, a Psalm of David. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor. Nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. He who does not put out his money at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. It's a great psalm. And look what Sonsino says at the top of page two. Because I, th I think this is the first, the first line in it, I think, is kind of interesting. Next to Psalm 23, this is the most popular chapter in the Psalter. Now, I don't think I would say that. I don't think most evangelicals would say that. I think most evangelicals would say, I really like this psalm. But I don't think they would put it on the same category as 103, or 107, or Psalm 8, or Psalm 22, or Psalm 2. But it is one of those Psalms that we love. But this is, I found this interesting because this is the, this is, the, Psalm seen as a Jewish commentary. And within the Jewish mindset, this is like one of the most popular Psalms. He goes on to say, it's commonly known as God's gentleman and is descriptive of the Hebraic idea of human character. The poetic questions convey the notion, which we today should briefly designate the idealism of life. Holiness and the image of the mountain of the Lord imply man's elevation up the mountain, above the low places of life, the upward soaring of the soul from the vulgar and commonplace to the nobility and the purity of moral views and conduct. The qualifications for entry into the divine presence are purely ethical and within the compass of all human beings. The Talmud remarked that the 613 commandments which are found in the Torah are summarized in this psalm meaning that their moral purpose is here crystallized. So what they are saying here is that this psalm captures really the essence of all of the commandments in the Torah. And in fact, the Talmud says that. The Talmud says that David actually summarized the 613 commandments into 11 commandments that are right here in this psalm. And I won't read them all because I just read the psalm. But that is essentially what they say that this psalm does. It just takes all 613 and they're all findable here. And the Talmud also, actually this is kind of interesting, identifies people who exemplify each of these 11 qualities. And many, many of these you, all, you already know, obviously. Like, for example, he who walks uprightly, this is Abraham. You know, you know who Abraham is. And you know who Jacob is. And you know who Hezekiah is. And you know who Jehoshaphat is. And then there's some names in here that you probably don't know. Like, I had to look them up, too. Some rabbis. Um, Abba Hilachu. Um, and actually, I'll tell his story a little bit in a few minutes. And another one, Rabbi Safra. And, and there are some other people that I won't tell their story tonight just by virtue of time. But there are people that the Talmud actually says, identify this. One th person who was interesting is Jacob, 
who has no slander on his tongue. And I don't think of Jacob in that sense. But the Jewish thought on Jacob is that he did not want to lie to his father and his mother told him to do it. It is interesting that the scripture says, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. And why would God say that? Because Jacob was willing to do what he did because he loved the idea of getting the blessing of his patriarchs. And Esau was willing to do what he did because he didn't care about the blessing of his patriarchs. So he sold everything for a bowl of beans, red beans, and ended up with the nickname Edom, which means red. So for the rest of his life, he was known as Red. So Jacob is actually a person that God loves because of his priorities. Well, the title of the psalm on page three. I thought it was, I thought, what can I say about the title of it? Because it's so short, the psalm of David. Well, this is, this is I thought this, you'd find this interesting. How many psalms did David actually write? Well, he actually wrote 75 of them. 73 of them are specifically identified in the superscription of the psalm as being a psalm of David. This is one of them. And then there are two other psalms that are identified as being written by David from the New Testament. So therefore, we have 75 psalms. We have seen that there are some psalms that say a psalm of David where when you really look at the psalm, it may not really be written by him because the Hebrew, a psalm of David, does not mean the Hebrew. In English, it does, but in the Hebrew, it doesn't mean he wrote it. It means it might mean it, but it might just mean it's a psalm like you would say, well, that song sounds like something Frank Sinatra would sing. That doesn't mean he did it. Okay, and so that's the Hebrew. That's really what the Hebrew is saying, the actual language. But he may have written 75 of them, but he didn't write 150 of them. So that's kind of just a point of interest. And then there are 13 of the Psalms that he wrote that actually have some information about why he, what the setting is when he wrote them. So that's kind of interesting. And as I looked at that, I thought to myself, in Acts 13, 22, the scripture says that David has, it's quoting 1 Samuel, David has a heart after the Lord. If you want to have kind of a cool Bible reading plan for 75 days, you could read a psalm that David wrote or that is attributed to him for 75 days. Now, all 150 of them, even though 75 of them, some of them are clearly not written by David, like Psalm 137 is written by the rivers of Babylon, and that's 500 years later. Okay, so some of the psalms are not written by David, but a lot of them are. So you could say all of them will give you the heart of David, but those 75 really would help you, and in a sense, sort of in your walk with God, inch towards becoming more like David, who has a heart after God. You would move your heart in that direction by just reading those Psalms. You could do one a day. So Psalm 15, verse 1. Let me, um, let me paint the picture. The Psalm can really be broken up into two pictures here. The first verse is God is serving as host. And the second verse through the rest of the Psalm is we are the guests. So in the first verse, it asks the question. It's like somebody, like a, a person is asking God now, Lord, who can abide in your tabernacle? Lord, who can dwell in your holy hill? That's the question. And then the rest of the psalm is going to give the answer to that. Okay? The message says it this way. God, who gets invited to dinner at your place? How do we get on your guest list? That's the psalm. That's the point of this psalm. Now, this, is, this gets kind of really, for me, this was really interesting. The word tabernacle is really the word for tent. Okay, it's not the temple built by Solomon. It's the tent. So it's a movable object. It does not have the stability of a, cedar, a house built of cedar. It's not a brick-and-mortar building. It's a tent. Tents are transient. They move. In fact, there's a number of ancient Hebrew manuscripts that will not use the word tent in the singular. 
because there are Hebrew manuscripts, ancient manuscripts, that actually will have the word tent in the plural, which is actually even adding to the idea that it's like this movable thing. The presence of God is moving. That's the idea here. And so it's not this strong sense of this is the spot. Okay, and in fact, this is really interesting. Almost all of the Jewish, ma Jewish English manuscripts like that you would read, like Sansinu and the Jewish Study Bible and Robert Alter and Kyla Delich, they don't use the word abide in the first line. They all use the word sojourn, which is an actual equally good translation of the word. It could mean sojourn. It could mean abide. But the Jewish manuscripts in English, like those manuscripts, other than the TLV, they don't use the word abide or dwell. They use this word sojourn. So the question really is, Lord, who can sojourn? The, 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 the Parsha that Tim read to us a little while ago, the pilgrimage feasts. Lord, who can pilgrimage with you? Lord, who can move around with you? And it's very fitting that this word sojourn actually fits the idea of a tent better than the word dwell, abide would fit with the word tent because the tent is moving. In fact, there's even this idea that possibly more than one tent. It's this moving presence of God. So in a sense... This idea of sojourning means, and as I was thinking about it this week, I was, I was thinking, what does this mean to me? When you go into the presence of God, you're changed. I think that if you were here last night, I mean, I, I went through the service with this thought in my mind. Everybody who's in this meeting right now is experiencing the presence of God. That's got to change you. Now, at the moment, we have moments like that where we think, I'm changed a lot. But you get a little bit older and you realize maybe it wasn't as much, but I was changed. As you look back in your life, it impacted my life. You cannot not be changed by an encounter with the presence of God. You go into that tent where God is and you are going to sojourn. You're going to have moved. It's going to change who you are. And in fact, the verse even seems to imply that you must be willing to change if you're actually going to enter his presence. And all of that begs the question of, am I willing to repent? Entering God's presence changes us. Lord, who can sojourn with you? If I'm going to hang with God, the tent is going to move. He's not changing, but the tent is moving, and he's not going to let me stay the same. That's what it means to sojourn with God. Willingness to change is required of those who would enter his presence. And then it uses the word dwell. Okay, so who may dwell in your holy hill? Now, this word dwell is different from the word sojourn or abide because this word really does mean like there. Not moving around, but there. And with such a strong word like that, it does not, it would not fit to put that word in a tent because I'm now dwelling. I'm now nailed down, if you will. So he's not going to use the word tent there. He's going to use something that's a lot stronger, a holy mountain. Because a mountain is really something that is solid. It has apparent permanence, and it's holy. In other words, it's separate. This idea that if I'm going to be living, locked in, nailed down in the presence of God. God's going to require some holiness of me. I'm going to have to move from the way I was to the way that he wants me to be. And when I'm willing to make that journey, I can end up at the place where I am now dwelling. And so this psalm opens with this question then. What does it take to be the guest in God's house. And that is the rest of the psalm. It opens with that question, 
And now the psalm just launches into this discussion of man's obligation towards people. This is interesting because there's nothing in the psalm from now on that's going to be about what God requires of us, as it were, in our relationship with him. It's all going to be about our relationship with people. The whole rest of the psalm. What does it take to dwell in the house of God? And the answer is going to be a really good relationship with people. That's the answer. It's like anybody associated with Gateway is going to love it because basically what it's saying is God really is all about people. (laughs) That's the psalm. And the whole rest of the psalm is going to tell us what God expects from us in our relationship with people. So, verse 2, he who walks uprightly. If I want to dwell in his tent, if I want to be the guest at his house, I have to walk uprightly. Okay, I have to work righteousness. I have to speak the truth in my heart. So the man who is invited into God's presence now is a man of integrity. Uh, uh, Probably everybody here knows the name Henry Cloud. Henry Cloud wrote a book probably 20 years ago that was called Integrity. And anybody here read it? It's a really good book. And in it, he talks about the fact that the the number, an an integer is one, two, three, four, five, and one and a half is not an integer. Two and a half, two and three quarters, those are not integers. Integrity is a whole person. Not a person who's got this piece over here and this piece over there and that piece over there, but, but not a person who compartmentalizes aspects of their world, but a person who really is the same. They're a whole person. And in fact, he makes the point in his book, which is really good, that a person of integrity is a growing person. There's the sojourning. And why are they growing? Well, the illustration I've used sometimes goes like this. You got married. Don and I, Donna got locked out of the house. That's why she's not here. She was on her way. She got, she's in the garage and she realized, I locked myself out. (laughs) So she's got a, she's got somebody coming to the, uh, a locksmith coming. So anyway, um, that's why she's not here. So Henry Cloud makes the point that, let's say that I, Donald, I've been married for 40 years. Okay, so she expected me to be faithful to her in the first year. That's a reasonable thing to expect, right? Day one, and I did from her as well. Thank God, by God's grace, we have been. But that's a reasonable request, not to lie, not to cheat, not to steal. If your second grader lies, cheats, or steals, you discipline them. If I am still not, if I haven't grown beyond that as a husband, then I really still am like a second grader in my relationship with my wife. She has the right to expect me to do better than a second grader, to be a better husband at 40 years than I was at one year. If you're not growing as a husband, you're actually cheating your wife, cheating your husband, if you're not growing. You see the point? Integrity is not just do not lie, do not cheat, do not steal. Integrity is growth. It requires sojourning. It requires that I be something different next year than I was last year. That's integrity. That's walking uprightly. So this is a person. The person in this psalm, the whole psalm now, it's going to be a person of character. He's upright. He's blameless. His words are, I said, should say restrained, not retrained. <laughs> Restrained. His allegiance to truth, despising the vile person, honoring the guilty or honoring the godly person, conducting his business with honor, 
honoring those who fear the Lord, not misusing his money, not doing usury, not bribing, doing the right things. These are the things that are required to, if we're going to dwell in God's presence. If I want, see, God is omnipresent. He's omnipresent. If I want to experience his presence, and not just this omnipresent, God is omnipresent. Take three chairs, put a, or say, say, take two chairs. I'll make it simple. A saved person and an unsaved person. Okay, and they're both sitting in that chair. Is God's presence in the space covered by that chair? Yes. Is God's presence in this space? Yes. He's omnipresent. That space could not exist if he were not there. In him, all things hold together. All things consist. It couldn't exist. It actually says in Psalms 139, verse 6, if I make my bed in heaven, if I go to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Hell is not the absence of God. Hell is the absence of the revelation of the presence of God. He's there. Because if he weren't there, it wouldn't exist. He's omnipresent. He, there is no place where he is not. It's not possible. See the point? He's everywhere. So if I really want to experience his presence, not just is he there, that's not the question. The question is, am I experiencing it? And if I'm not experiencing it, then something is going wrong. And it's not him because he's there. And I'm the one that needs to move. I need to change something because I need to experience God. That's the psalm. How I'm treating people is going to determine whether or not I'm going to be experiencing God in this world. So his words are restrained. He's, a, he's got a lead. These are all matters. It is kind of interesting. One thing, I know the, the, song, the, the Talmud says there are 11 commandments that David, he summarizes everything down to 11. I found, and, the, you know, and I, I don't know where I'm going to fall on this. I don't have an answer to this. Because the Talmud says there are 11 commandments, and they're all here in this, in this psalm. But word biblical commentary, and also some other commentaries I saw, make the point that there's actually 10 commandments here, like the 10 commandments. And that's how they break it up. And there's some positive ones, and there's some negative ones. There's 10 commandments, just like the 10 commandments have some positive commandments, Honor your father and mother. That's a positive commandment. It has some negative commandments. Thou shalt not lie. Bear false witness. So it has both. And this idea of the Ten Commandments, ten being the number of completion, seven being the number of perfection. You know, there's seven days. The Word of God is the Sabbath is the seventh day. The Word of God is like silver tried in a furnace seven times. Seven is the number of perfection. And ten is the number of completion. The complete picture. Daniel says, let me fast for, eat this kind of food for 10 days. In other words, test me completely. And in Revelation, the church of Smyrna says, God says to them, you're going to be tested for 10 days, a complete test. And so the Ten Commandments represent this idea of this, these commandments. They're not detailing all of the details of your life, but they will cover every part of your life. Everything. Cover your relationship with your parents. Cover your relationship with time. Cover your relationship with God. Cover your relationship with marriage. It covers every part of your life. Not the details, but everything. And this psalm is like that. So it says we must walk uprightly, which means to be complete, which means to be ethically sound and upright. The same word is used of God in, when God calls Abraham in Genesis 17, verse 1, when he says, walk before me and be blameless. It's the same word. It is kind of interesting that I, I mentioned this before, actually. Um, in, in rabbinic thinking, there is this idea that when you wake up in the morning, you go from being um, horizontal to being vertical. And you become upright. 
That's actually what happens. And when you become upright, the parts of your being that relate to the heart and mind and the breath are lifted above the more animalistic natures that are below. So you become upright. And humanity is really the only being that really lives upright. Does that make sense? So Jewish people have a Hasidic Jews, not, not, not all Orthodox Jews. Orthodox Hasidic Jews actually have a rabbinic thing where they have to put a belt on to pray. No matter when it is they're going to pray, they have to put a belt on. And the belt they wear all the time is not sufficient. So they have to have a belt for the purpose of praying. And the purpose of the belt is to separate what is below from what is above. It's called a gartel, like a garter belt. But it's a gartel. And this is so I, I, I've always wanted to just have one. Okay, why is this thing so long? He eats a lot. <laughs> that is the honest truth. That is the only reason this thing is so long. Okay, there is, when you buy them online, there's no such a thing as it's going to be this length. So this thing will wrap around me again and again and again. And you put it on, and actually, there is no prayer that you're supposed to say. There's no right way to, it's not like putting on the tzvillim where there's, there's rules. There are no rules. <laughs> there are no rules. You just put the belt on, and you pray, and it reminds you when you pray to live above. This is why if you go into a, an orthodox synagogue, you'll see the men on one side and the women on the other. It's not that one is superior to the other. It's that our mind should be focused on something while we're praying. That's the picture. And so the three things, and I really do, and I've done this now for months. In the morning when I wake up, I put my shoes on because there's a Jewish prayer for that. Lord, because now when you put your shoes on, you say you're a businessman. I'm ready to go out and do what I need to do. And God has already provided for everything that I'm going to collect today. So I am now got my shoes on. I'm ready to go out and just collect what you have for me. It takes away the stress. So the way I pray it is, Lord, I'm ready to go collect what you want me to collect for you today. And I pray that when I put my shoes on. It's that simple. And then when I put my belt on, this belt, not that belt. <laughs> Lord, I thank you that today help me to live above the belt and not below the belt. And then when I put my keep on, Lord, help me to have the mind of, of Christ. It's really that simple. Jews will pray those kinds of prayers. But that, that's what the gar gartel is. And then it says, it says, not only must he walk uprightly, but he must work righteousness. This is interesting. Tzedek, righteousness, all-embracing, a term for honest, straightworthy, straightworthy dealing, straightforward dealing, doing the, what is ethically right. And if you look at that word tzedek, and you look at the word tzedakah, you can see it's the same word. Can you see that? Okay, so what is tzedakah? It's charity. So I gave one of my grandsons recently a tzedakah box. Right? It's like a little thing you can put money in whenever, and then you can give the money to some charity. So he's doing this. It's just like, you know, so um, I've said one of the people I said I would mention later that was in that list. Okay, he's here. The personification of this trait, Tzedek, is Abba Hilkiah, whose piety is described at length in the Talmud. Once the country was in need of rain, and two rabbis were sent to ask him to pray, they went out to the field where they found him hoeing. They greeted him, but they, he did not even turn his face to them. Later, after the day was gone, or done, he explained to the rabbis that he was a day laborer and would be cheating his employer if he so much as greeted them when he was being paid to work. That's righteousness. So he, he is, according to the Talmud, exemplifying this trait. 
But I wanted to share an article with you, and I'm going to read. It's a long article. It's worth reading. Okay. It's about tzedakah related to the word tzedek. Obviously the same word. You can see it. Okay. And you'll see why I'm reading it. Um, and there's the, the link for it. Helping the poor and the needy is a duty in Judaism. Jews are among the most generous donors to charities. Jews do not limit their generosity to Jewish charities. And Rambam, who is Maimonides, the most significant Jewish person um, since they would, Judaism would say since the closing of the Old Testament, since they would say since the closing of the Bible because they don't accept the New Testament. Um, but Rambam classified ways of doing charity by their level of merit. I think it's kind of interesting. But that'll be at the end. But the, I'm reading the article for, for another cause. Once at a comedy message board, we were listing oxymorons like jumbo shrimp, military intelligence, and athletic scholarship. Somebody posted Jewish charity on the list. Normally, I have a pretty good sense of humor when it comes to jokes about cheap Jews. But that one really bothered me. Because charity is a fundamental part of the Jewish way of life. Traditional Jews give at least 10% of their income to charity. Traditional Jewish homes commonly have a pushka, a box for collecting coins for the poor. I just described that to you a few minutes ago. And coins are routinely placed in the box. Jewish youths are continually going from door to door collecting for various worthy causes. I did that growing up. Greg, you probably did too. That's the way we grew up, right? A standard mourner's prayer includes a statement that the mourner will make a donation to charity in memory of the deceased. In many ways, charitable donation has taken the place of animal sacrifice in Jewish life. Giving to charity is an almost instinctive Jewish response to express thanks to God, to ask forgiveness from God, or to request a favor from God. According to Jewish tradition, the spiritual benefit of giving to the poor is so great that a beggar actually does the giver a favor by giving the person the opportunity to perform tzedakah. Business Week's 2006 list of the 50 most generous philanthropists included at least 15 Jews. Now that's roughly 30%, right? A third, because 15 times three is 45. So roughly a third of the most generous philanthropists, according to Business Week, are actually Jewish. And how many Jews are there? Less than 2% of the population. But a third of the largest givers are Jews. The Chronicle of Philanthropy's list of the top 50 charitable donors in 2008 included 16 Jews, according to the JTA article. In other words, Jews are only about 2% of the American population are 30% of the most generous donors. Similarly, a 2003 study reported in the Jewish Journal found that 24 and a half or a quarter of all mega donors who donate more than $10 million a year to charity are Jewish. Nor is Jewish generosity limited to Jewish causes. While a few of the Jews in Business Week's top 50 list Jewish causes among their primary charitable targets, most don't. Indeed, the Jewish Journal article laments the fact that the overwhelming majority of those Jewish mega donors aren't going to specifically Jewish causes. Let me just kind of highlight this for a moment for you. I'm not suggesting these Jewish philanthropists are standing up for causes that you and I like. George Soros, he'd be one of those people. But I think we could quickly name some both Republicans and Democrats who are amazingly big at giving, who are unbelievably, in our opinion, bad people on both sides of the political aisle. The point of the article, and my point here, is not to say that this is a good or a bad person, but to make the point that this idea of giving is core to the Jewish culture. 
far more core than in the church culture. Incomparably more. That's my point. When you got a third of the top givers being Jewish, right, when only 2% of the people are Jewish, that says something about the culture. So let me read on. The meaning of the word tzedakah is the Hebrew word for the acts that we call charity. In English, giving aid, assistance and money to the poor and needy or to other worthy causes. However, the nature of tzedakah is different from the idea of charity. The word charity suggests benevolence and generosity, a magnanimous act by the wealthy and powerful for the benefit of the poor and needy. The word tzedakah is derived from the Hebrew word tzadeh, dalit, kuf, meaning righteousness, justice, or fairness. There it is right there. That's the word. In Judaism, giving to the poor is not viewed as a generous, magnanimous act. It is simply an act of justice and righteousness, the performance of a duty, giving the poor their due. Giving to the poor is an obligation in Judaism, a duty that cannot be forsaken even by those who are themselves in need. Some sages have said that tzedakah is the highest of all commandments, equal to all of them combined, and that a person who does not perform tzedakah is equivalent to an idol worshiper. This is probably hyperbole, but it illustrates the importance of tzedakah in Jewish thought. Tzedakah is one of the three acts that gain us forgiveness from our sins. Obviously, we don't believe that, but I'm describing Jewish culture. Okay. Um, the High Holiday Liturgy repeatedly states that God has inscribed the judgment against all who have sinned, but teshuva, or repentance, tefillah, or prayer, and tzedakah can alleviate the degree. See the Days of All article. According to Jewish law, we are required to give one-tenth of our income to the poor. This is generally interpreted as one-tenth of our net income after payment of taxes. Taxes themselves do not fulfill our obligation to give tzedakah, even though a significant portion of tax revenues in America and many other countries are used to provide for the poor and needy. Those who are dependent on public assistance or living on the edge of subsidence may give less but must still give to the extent that they are able. However, no person should give so much that he would become a public burden. The obligation to perform tzedakah can be fulfilled by giving money to the poor, to health care institutions, to synagogues or educational institutions. It can also be fulfilled by supporting your children beyond the age when you're legally required to or supporting your parents in their old age. The obligation includes giving to both Jews and Gentiles, contrary to popular belief. Jews do not just take care of their own. Quite contrary, a study reported in the Jewish Journal indicated that Jewish mega-donors who give more than $10 million a year to charity found that only 6% of their mega-dollars went specifically to Jewish causes. Judaism acknowledges that many people who ask for charity have no genuine need. In fact, the Talmud suggests that this is a good thing. If all people were asked for charity were in genuine need, we would be subject to punishment from God for refusing anyone who asked. The existence of frauds diminishes our, li our liability for failing to give to all who ask because we have some legitimate basis for doubting the beggar's sincerity. It is permissible to investigate the legitimacy of a charity before donating to it. We have an obligation to avoid becoming in need of tzedakah. A person should, should take any work that is available, even if he thinks it's beneath his dignity, to avoid becoming a public charge. However, if a person is truly in need and has no way to obtain money on his own, he should not feel embarrassed to accept tzedakah. No person should feel too proud to take money from others. In fact, it is considered a transgression to refuse tzedakah. One source says that to make yourself suffer by refusing to accept tzedakah is equivalent to shedding your own blood. And then this last part of the article. Actually, I talked about this with my grandson 
as we're working towards his bar mitzvah. And why do you think this is more important than this? Why do you think this is more important? Than, why do you think it was, a, it was a good conversation? But here we go. Certain kinds of tzedakah are considered more meritorious than others. The Talmud describes these different levels of tzedakah, and Rambam, that's Maimonides, organized them into a list. The levels of charity from the least meritorious to the most meritorious. Number one, giving begrudgingly. That's, you know, what you gave. I gave. <laughs> giving less than you should, but giving it cheerfully. Giving after being asked. Giving before being asked. Giving when you do not know the recipient's identity, but the recipient knows your identity. Giving when you know the recipient's identity, but the recipient doesn't know your identity. Giving when neither party knows the other's identity and enabling the recipient to become self-reliant. Kind of an interesting article, isn't it? The reason I wanted to read the article to you, and I didn't want to just read part of it because the whole thing is so interesting, is because it shows statistically that Jewish people are givers. And one of the things that Jewish people find offensive is the idea of the joke of them being cheap, which is the reason that Jews don't like jokes about how much money they have, because it comes to the place where they feel like people are expecting them to give more, right? And so it, it carries this idea that, we're, that they're cheap. So Jews just don't like those kinds of jokes. And you might compare it to, Jews might joke about it, but you might compare it to the way, for example, white people should not use the N-word. It's a little different if a black person uses the N-word than if a white person uses the N-word, right? It's understandable, okay? I hope you understand that, okay? <laughs> I'm not encouraging anybody to use the word, right? But it's different. It's a different scenario. And so you'll hear Jewish people sometimes talk about, like I, I heard Michael Brown not that long ago make a comment about Jewish success. And we do do that, but it's just different. And I'm just giving you some insight into the Jewish mind, if you will. I hope that's helpful. I'm going to skip all of this stuff on page 7 because it's 5.15. Um, there's an art, interesting thing there about Rob Safra on the bottom of page, on the bottom right of page 7. And then... Um, I'm really just going to skip all of this except for the very end on page 9. Okay, so Psalm 15, 5. It's all interesting stuff. It's like really all interesting. But this verse, in verse 15, 5, he who does not put out his money at us usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent, he who does these things shall never be moved. That phrase right there. He shall never be moved. Okay, so he shall never be shaken. He shall never be overthrown. Art Scroll says he shall never falter. Jewish Study Bible, he shall never be shaken. Robert Alter, he shall never stumble. Rashi, who is the guy, the main guy on Safari, says if he falters, his faltering will not be permanent faltering, but he will falter and ascend. In other words, he will end up going higher. And as a phrase that I've used many times in ministry, especially when ministers feel like they're being lied about or hurt, and I've told them many times, the truth will eventually come out and you will be vindicated. And that is a truth of life. Radek, he said, even after death, he will not fall because his soul will dwell in a place of celestial glory. And I love that quote. Why? Because there are Jewish people who will say, well, we don't know necessarily if there's a heaven or a hell. They don't know their own Jewishness because Judaism is very big on the idea of heaven and hell. And though Jews who say that, they're typically reformed or maybe they're conservative, but they're definitely not religious. <laughs> okay? Um, so the psalm, this psalm, and the reason why I, I'm, I wanted to include this is because of the last stuff on the bottom right of page 9. This psalm is often used in Jewish funerals as a eulogy. This is really common in a funeral to use Psalm 15. The point is that even in death, they will never be shaken. That's the point. In other words, this person 
is secure. That's why this psalm is used. So um, one thing that is interesting, the very bottom right, Gamaliel, you'll know him because he was the Apostle Paul's mentor. And he said he would weep whenever he read Psalm 15. This is in the Talmud. He said, because if somebody did all of these virtuous deeds, he will never be moved, but not merely on account of one of them. In other words, if you only did one, you're, you're at risk. But Rabbi Akiva, who is the father of rabbinic Judaism, said, if you only do one, you're good. <laughs> and that is standard Talmud right there. Two rabbis completely disagreeing, and sometimes they call each other's names as they do it. <laughs> Praise the Lord.